the great month here in December, and those are always packed out, two and four o'clock. We always encourage you to come early. We don't uh, have tickets online or anything like that. It's just if you get here and get a seat, great for you. If you're late and you don't get a seat, you should have been on time. It's a highlight of the year, I promise you, and we'll have a great time. Coming up Christmas Eve, our Christmas Day services will be online only. But there'll be multiple opportunities for you to enjoy a very special service that we'll be putting together for you for Christmas Day. And then New Year's Day, starting 2023, we'll be here 9 and 11 o'clock. And we're going to have a great time all through the month leading into a new year. There are certain words in the English language that we probably are all familiar with, but yet we don't use them very often. Let me give you some examples. The word serendipitous. Serendipity just simply means a happy and unexpected discovery or event, but you don't find a lot of people using the word serendipity. Let me give you another one. Gobbledygook. That's a real word in the English language, gobbledygook. My kids have spoken gobbledygook many, many times, but it's an actual word. Here's what it means. A text riddled with official jargon and extremely complex sentence structures. Here's another one, scrumptious. We know that word, right? Scrumptious just means a delicious meal. But I don't know in all of my life, if I've ever said to my wife, and she's a phenomenal cook, I don't know if I've ever said, babe, that was scrumptious. I just say, babe, that was delicious, you know. Let me give you another one. It's a Christmas word. And probably most of you have sung it. It's actually a word in one of my favorite Christmas carols. But oftentimes we sing right past it. We don't know what it means, but it's the word pining. It comes from the Christmas carol, O holy night, O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Pining. The word pining just simply means suffering with or expressing longing or yearning for someone or something. There's another definition. Failing gradually in health or vitality, especially from grief, regret, or longing. We know that the holiday season can come with a bit mixed bag of emotions for different people. We have shorter days. We have colder weather. We have less vitamin D because we're not outside as much and the days are not as long. And you couple that with the emotions of uh, the memories of people who are no longer with us during the holidays and at Christmas time. And it can be a really tough season for some people. For many people, they suffer emotionally. There was a survey by the American Psychological Association that found that 38 percent of people felt their stress levels increase during the holiday season. I thought that was kind of low. I would say in my household, it's like 100%. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you get a little stressed out during the holidays because of all that you have to tend to. The Alliance, the National Alliance on Mental Illness found that 64% of the people who are living with a mental illness reported that their conditions worsened during the holidays. Now, this is not a message about uh, mental illness or emotional illness, but I did want to just pause for a moment and say a couple of years ago, I was, I was asked to be a contributing author to a book on mental health, and myself and a few other pastors and some psychologists all contributed chapters to this book that just recently came out, and it's really receiving rave reviews. It's called Mental Health Ministry, and I just want to mention that to you. We're carrying copies in the bookstore, and after the first service when I mentioned it, they all sold out. But I've been told by our staff we will have more copies next week. And it would be a great Christmas gift, I think, for some people that maybe are struggling in that area. And I just want you to know I don't get a dime from this. I don't get a dime, but I am honored that I got to contribute one of the chapters in the book. So I would encourage you maybe as you're doing some Christmas shopping, Keep that in mind. Stop by the bookstore next Sunday, and you can maybe pick up a copy of that book. Well, there's a word that our December 
uh, series is kind of built around, and it's a word like some of those other ones that I mentioned that we're familiar with, but we probably just don't use it that often, and the word is dwell. The word dwell just simply means to live or stay as a permanent resident, second definition, to live or continue in a given condition or state, to live or continue in a, 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 a given condition or state. It's not typical that we would say to somebody, hey, I think we ought to dwell together. We would just say, we ought to live together. Or we, we don't say, hey, why don't you guys stop by our dwelling this evening and we'll have coffee and dessert together. We won't say that, but here's the interesting thing. That word dwell is found all throughout Scripture. It's a very important word for us. And so in the month of December, even leading up to Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, we're going to be just taking some thoughts from Scripture based on that word dwell. And today we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. Romans chapter 8. If you have a device or your Bible with you, I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to ask you, as we do every week, to stand to honor the Bible as I read some verses, beginning in verse 5 through verse 11 from Romans chapter 8. Come on, how many of you believe that the Bible is still the greatest book on the planet? Are you thankful for His Word today? We stand when we read the Word of God here every week at the refuge, not as some form of liturgy, but really in honor of the Word of God and how thankful we are for His Word. That means so much to us. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is what? Death. But to set the mind on the Spirit, capital S, is, say it, life and... For the mind that is set on the flesh, watch this, is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells, dwells, there's the word, in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I cannot wait to unpack this with you today. The concept of the spirit of God dwelling on the inside of us and bringing life to our mortal bodies, bringing life to our spirit, and giving life to everything about who we are. Come on, before you're seated, let's make some declarations together. Everybody out loud. You ready? Go. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. And health to my bones. I will be a... And not a... And I am confident of this. We'll complete it. Amen. If you believe that, shout amen. 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 You can be seated. And as always, we've prepared notes that are on the Refuge app for you. And I strongly, strongly encourage you, take notes, fill in the blanks. You can archive those, keep up with those throughout the year. Listen, there's a big difference between visiting and dwelling. A visit from the in-laws during the holidays is one thing, but to have them move in with you is entirely different. Listen, when Cousin Eddie pulls up with the broken down RV in front of your house and you think that he's only there for a few days, that's one thing. But when Cousin Eddie announces that he and the family are planning to stay for a month or longer, that changes the game just a little bit. 
The word dwell that we read in Romans chapter 8 comes from a Greek word, okio, and it simply means, watch, to occupy a house, to reside, to inhabit. To occupy or to reside or to inhabit. Listen to me, church. Many people, and this is so distressing to me as a pastor and a shepherd who cares so much about you and about others, but many people today are still losing the mind war still living in a state of depression, caving to negative thoughts, surrendering to the temptations of the flesh, all because they have not cultivated a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. God never intended for you to be a slave and a prisoner to depression or fear. He never intended for you to lose the mind war. He sacrificed his son Jesus on the cross so that you could be victorious, not just in your spirit, but also in your mind. Verses 5 and 6, we read a moment ago. It says, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, capital S, and the implication is very clear. This is a person. And you can have a relationship with a person. You cannot have a relationship with an inanimate object. You can, but everybody will think you're a weirdo. You think you can have a relationship with one of your house plants. And I know some of you talk to your plants. I can't have a relationship with this podium. You can have a relationship with a person. And many people have forfeited the great victorious life of Christianity because they've never embraced the concept of having a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Come on, are you with me? For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Listen to me. For you to experience joy in this season, victory in your thought life, peace in the midst of chaos and confusion. You don't need a visitation of the Holy Spirit. You need the habitation of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. You don't need to just have a Sunday morning encounter with the Holy Spirit. You don't need to just encounter him during Selah, our 21 days of fasting and prayer. You don't need to just encounter him during launch at the end of January. Listen to me, church. You need for the Holy Spirit to back the moving truck up to your heart and to move it permanently inside of your life. Big difference between visiting and dwelling. You need the indwelling of the Spirit of God, not just a visitation of his presence. You don't just need a night out with the guys. You don't just need a a shopping trip or dinner or another glass of your favorite wine with the girls. No, what you need is for the Holy Spirit to occupy and to inhabit and to take up residence on the inside of you. Verse 7 through 9, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let me say that again. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Watch this, verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If... In fact, the Spirit of God dwells, occupies, inhabits, takes up residence on the inside of you. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Watch. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where's the house that you will build for me. Second question, where will my my resting place? Some versions might say dwelling place. Where will my resting place be? That's a question from God. Where's the habitation that you're building? Where's the room that you're preparing inside of your heart for the Holy Spirit to come in and to take up residence on the inside of you? Where is that God is asking? So for the next few moments, that's what I want us to focus on. 
is how do we build a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit? Is it okay if I just share four things very quickly with you? Come on, church, are you with me? It's okay if I just share four things with you about how to prepare a dwelling place for the person of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you how it starts. It starts by us cleaning up. We got to clean up. Now listen to me, you don't have to get your act together before you can come to God. How many of you are thankful he takes you just like you are, right? In all of your mess and all of your addiction and all of your brokenness and all of your pride, he takes us just the way that we are. But I, I want you to think about something. Think about a person that you admire greatly. Think about, may, maybe it's an athlete, maybe it's an actor, maybe it's some world leader. Maybe it's somebody who's been hugely successful in the business world. And let's just say that you got noticed that this person that you admire so much was coming to your house, was coming for a visit. Would you be casual about that? Let's just say this represents your house. Got your nice little Christmas tree up. Get your nice chairs. If this represented your house, and what I'm talking about is not a physical home, I'm talking about your spirit. But let's just say this was your house and somebody of great notoriety was going to come and visit you. Would you be casual about it and just go, oh, shoot, look at this, man. I need a clear place for them to sit. Now we're good. Perfect. I don't think you would be that casual about it. I think if you knew somebody were coming that you would say, you know what, I got to do something about this mess. I can't leave all this stuff laying around. Look at this. What a pig pen this is. We got to clean this mess up because, listen, the bottom line is this. Listen to me, church. The Holy Spirit is attracted to holiness. It's in his name. The Holy Spirit Again, it doesn't mean that you've got to get everything together before you can come to Him. But there's a responsibility on our part to recognize, man, we've allowed some clutter to build up inside of our spirit. And if we want to create a dwelling place for Him to come and to occupy and to take up residence in us, we got to pick some of this mess up. We can't leave this stuff laying around because the bottom line is this. Listen to me. There are things that clutter up our lives and clog our capacity for the Holy Spirit. Relationships. We recognize that relationship is toxic. I can't keep that in my life. Those habits, those things I've been doing, how did I ever get to this place? I can't just leave that laying around. I can't be casual about that. I got to get this stuff up. There's some mindsets that are contrary to the Word of God. I got to get those things out of my life. Look at this. Laundry that never got put away, never got folded. I can't just leave that around. I got somebody important that's coming to my house. I got to get this stuff up. I think we would do everything we could to impress the person that were coming to our house to make sure that when they came, things were in order. But the person I'm talking about is greater than any athlete or celebrity or world figure or business leader. I'm talking about the person of the Holy Spirit who wants to take up a residence. He didn't want to just pop in for a, a one or two day visit. He wants to take up a residence on the inside of your heart. And again, I want to say, if you want to experience the joy of the season and the peace that passes all understanding, it doesn't just come with a visitation of the Spirit of God. It comes with a habitation of the Spirit of God on the inside of you. And listen to me, you can never expect that things that are contrary to the nature of God and the Word of God, you cannot expect to keep those things in your life and have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It's not going to happen. That's why we have to clean up. Clean up. We've got we to get rid of some stuff. In Genesis 32, there's a story of a man who had lived his entire life as, as a deceiver. He was a manipulator. It was all about himself. He didn't really care about other people, and it was just his nature. In fact, his name spoke to his nature. 
He'd been estranged from his brother for 15 going on 20 years. But he was going to have an opportunity to meet his brother. And he immediately resorted to his old ways by sending gifts to try to impress his brother. But God wanted to do something deeper in his life. In Genesis 32, we find the story of this man by the name of Jacob. Beginning in verse 22, watch. That night Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? He wanted him to acknowledge that his nature was contrary to the nature of God. What is your name? Deceiver. That's my name, Jacob. And then he says to him, your name will no longer be deceiver, but Israel, God's chosen, the one whom God loves, because you've struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. You see, because Jacob was willing to declutter his life and to empty himself, and by the way, uh, the word Jabbok, it says he crossed the stream of the Jabbok. The word Jabbok means emptying. Jacob had to empty himself before he could be filled up with the things of God. Do you understand we have to empty our lives of mindsets and habits and relationships and actions that are contrary to the Word of God if we want to be filled up by the things of God? It starts by us being willing to do a little cleaning. Here's the second thing. We have to cultivate the atmosphere. Maybe you've, maybe you've cleaned up. It's great. But how many of you know, even after you do some cleaning, <laughs> there can still be some odors around that aren't too great. You've got to cultivate the atmosphere. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about creating an atmosphere for the fragrance of God to dwell through worship. I'm talking about burning the flame of intercession in your life. Creating that atmosphere where he's welcome to come and not just pay a visit, but he feels welcome to come because you've cultivated an atmosphere of the presence of God and of worship and of prayer and of the saturation of the Word of God that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5 where he talks about the washing of the water of the Word. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify the church. Watch how with the washing of the water of the Word. Is there anybody here who would say, you know what, my mind could use some washing of the water of the Word. Like I need to just daily be purified by the Word of God. Washed by the Word of God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 that we, we cannot conform ourselves to the behaviors and the patterns of this world, but we've got to be transformed, transformed by the renewing, by the washing of our minds. Listen, unfortunately, a majority of Christ's followers have been seduced into an egocentric, self-exalting lifestyle that leaves little room for God. We'll spend hours on Reels or TikTok. We'll spend hours streaming video hours filling our minds with things that just don't nourish our spirit, hours on video games, and give little to no priority to time with God. We all have the same amount of time, 86,400 seconds per day. 
24 hours in a day, we all have the same time and we all get the privilege of deciding how to slice the pie and how we delegate that time that we all have. Don't tell me you don't have time to be in the Word of God. I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me you don't have time to pray. You got the same amount of time as anybody else. It's just a, a simple matter of priority of cultivating an atmosphere of saying, Holy Spirit, when you come and we hang out, mm, I want you to smell the fragrance of our Father. I want you to feel that intercession, Holy Spirit. I want you to come. I don't want you to just pop in for a visit from time to time. I need you, Holy Spirit. I need relationship with you. I need you to come and sit down, and I need for us to hang out together. And you cannot do that if you don't prioritize time with him. If you don't spend time in the word, if you don't develop a lifestyle of worship, if you don't learn what it means to pray. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 is a familiar verse of Scripture. We're going to read it out loud together and we're going to take it one step further because I'm going to ask you between today and next Sunday that you memorize one verse, this verse. You memorize this verse. Write it down right now. Mark it, copy it, whatever you need to do. Put it on note cards. Stick it on your fridge. Stick it on your bathroom mirror. Put it on the dash of your car. But I want you this week to meditate on this verse and memorize this one verse. We're going to read it out loud together. You ready? Go. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there's any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. One verse. Don't tell me you don't have time this week to memorize one verse, but I want you to saturate your mind. I want you to remind yourself this week in the midst of the chaos and the stress and the confusion and the mind wars of the enemy i want you to say over and over above your life if you have to read it to yourself over and over i want you to declare this week today god i'm going to think on things that are true honest just pure lovely and of good report and father if there's any virtue of praise i'm thinking on these things and not things that are depressing not things that are contrary to the word of god not things that are evil not things that are selfish i'm thinking on these things Number three, I told you I had four things. Here's number three. We have to create space. We have to create space. We do that in two ways. Number one, we have to be willing to evict some unwanted guest. You ever heard the word squatter? Let me tell you what a squatter is by definition. A squatter is a person who settles or occupies property without title, right, or payment of rent. Let me read that again. A person who settles or occupies property without title, right, or payment of rent. Listen, I know so many believers who have allowed squatters to take up space in their heart and in their mind, and they have no legal right to be there. They're not paying rent. They don't have a title to be there. So what do you do? You're trying to create a, create a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, and there might be somebody else that's occupying the space that belongs to the Lord, that's occupying the space that belongs to the Holy Spirit. What are you going to do about it? You've got to kick them out and evict them because they have no right. They're not paying rent. You've got to kick depression out of your life. You've got to kick addiction out of your life. Come on, you've got to kick pride out of your life. Kick lust out of your life. Kick anger out of your life. Kick rebellion out of your life. You've got to evict these things that have no right whatsoever to take up the space that was meant for the Holy Spirit. Are you with me today? Here's the second way that we create space. We've got to plan time in our schedule. Plan time. Plan time. 
plan time in your schedule. What a shame it would be if somebody lived with you and you never gave any thought to including them in your schedule. Never gave any thought to spending time with them. Let me tell you what would happen. There would be no relationship. No relationship whatsoever. We have some elders here, Michael and Janet Roberts, and a few weeks ago their son and daughter-in-law came to visit from California along with their four children, Michael and Janet's four grandkids. And they were going to be with Michael and Janet for five days. They didn't want them to go to a hotel. They knew it was going to be challenging. They knew it was going to be crowded. But for weeks ahead of time, they began to create space. Now, it wasn't convenient for them to do that. They had to take Michael's office in their house and turn it into a bedroom. They had to put beds in there. They put up stuff on the walls because they wanted those grandkids to have an amazing experience for just five days. Five days. It cost them a lot of money. It cost them time. But they knew it would be worth it. We have to be willing to prioritize and schedule time with the Lord and time with the Holy Spirit, knowing that if we'll create space for Him and prepare the atmosphere, that when we sit down with Him, there's going to be these special exchanges that happen with the Holy Spirit that are going to transform our lives. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I have an office in my house, and at 5 o'clock every morning, I'm in my chair in my office, for time with the Lord. But I'll be honest, there are days that I sit in that chair. I feel weary. I feel like the heavens are brass. I feel like I have difficulty communicating with the Lord and connecting with the Lord. And I just sit there and sometimes my time with Him, my, my time in the Word, my time of prayer doesn't feel super rich or meaningful. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? But I believe this, that if I'll be faithful to just show up, that even when I don't feel it, even when I don't see it, there's a transformation happening to my heart. If I just show up and spend time with Him, if I just show up and sit with Him. Here's the last thing, and then we're going to pray. We've talked about cleaning up and cultivating the atmosphere and creating some space, but we also have to communicate. How awkward would it be if somebody were in our house and we never spoke to them, we never communicated with them. Relationships require that two-way communication. God, we know, is always faithful to speak. He is. It's never a problem with Him speaking. The problem sometimes, oftentimes, is with us hearing. But if we'll create space and if we'll listen for his voice, he'll always be faithful to speak to us. But listen to me, God also wants you to communicate to him. He wants you to share your heart with him, your feelings, your struggles, your anxieties. He wants you to communicate those things to him. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example... We don't know what God wants us to pray for. Watch. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Listen to me. When you cultivate a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, there is available to you a heavenly prayer language. Some of you have heard about this. It's called praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues. You say, I don't get that. I was always told that was of the devil. I don't understand that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to even explore that in my own life. And let me just tell you, the Holy Spirit is so wonderful. He's so amazing. And he just wants to come in and dwell on the inside of you. And what he does, and listen, it was Jesus who said, it's better if I go away. Because if I do, I'm going to send one just like myself. His name is Paracletos. His name is Advocate. His name is Holy Spirit. And if I go away, he's going to come. He's going to dwell on the inside of you. 
He's going to guide you into all truth. He's going to comfort you when you need to be comforted. He's going to give you wisdom when you need wisdom. When you need power to be a, an example or a testimony and you can't do this in your own strength, he's going to give you the spirit that you need, the power, the dunamis that you need to accurately represent who he is. And this is also going to happen. There's going to be times in your life that you just don't know how to pray. Like you're in such agony. You can't put language to your prayers. <laughs> Here's what's so beautiful about him. The Bible says all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will begin to pray on your behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. This prayer language, this heavenly prayer language that connects with the Father where he's making intercession to the Father in a heavenly language. Paul says this as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 and 15. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall I do? Should I just not do that, Paul's asking. Should I, since I don't understand what I'm praying, should I just never use my prayer language? No. He answers the question. He says, I'll pray in the Spirit, and I'll also pray in words I understand. I'll sing in the Spirit, and I'll also sing in words that I understand. Listen to me, church. Every single day of my life, it's my goal that I pray with understanding and that I pray in the Spirit, that I exercise my prayer language every single day. It's my goal that every day I sing songs of worship in English, but also that I sing in the Spirit so that my spirit connects with Him in a way that I'm not able to do on my own. You have to communicate with Him. If we want to build a dwelling place where the Holy Spirit feels welcome, we have to clean up have to get rid of some mindsets and actions, relationships, habits that are contrary to who he is. We have to cultivate an atmosphere, create some space for him, and learn, then learn how to communicate with him. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet across the auditorium today. Would you just hold steady for another couple of moments? Come on, just hang steady. Just bow your heads and close your eyes right there where you stand. God sent his son, Jesus, Emmanuel, to come and to dwell on the inside of us, to live on the inside of us, to take up residence with us, to occupy, to inhabit our heart and our spirit. Not because he's a control freak, but because he wants to give to you everything you need pertaining to life and godliness. There may be some of you here today, maybe some that are watching online, and you would say, I'm not in a relationship with Jesus. I don't say that with any judgment to you today. Maybe you were at one point in your life and things have just happened and you've just drifted away from that relationship with him, or maybe you never were. Maybe all you ever understood was religion. You never knew a relationship with Jesus was possible. If you're here in this place or you're watching online and you're not in a relationship with Jesus, I'm not going to embarrass you, but in just a moment, when I count to three, all I'm going to ask you to do right where you stand is to throw your hand up real high so I can see who it is that I'm praying for today. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus, but there's something on the inside that says, that's what I need. I've tried to do it my own way, but I need to have a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. When I count to three, come on, throw it up high. Ready? One, two, three. Put it up real high if that's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being honest today. Come on, just hold it up for a moment, if you will. Come on, you lifted it up. Just hold it up there for a moment. I'm telling you, God is honored. God is blessed by your honesty, by your acknowledgement. I can't do this on my own. I need him today. I need him in my life. Come on, is there anybody else you didn't lift your hand, but you feel like you should have? Come on, do it right now, because we're going to pray in just a moment. If that's you, come on, do it right now. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Come on, don't miss this moment to say before I walk out of these doors, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. Now listen, the worship team is going to lead us in just a moment. 
And there's some of you, you need to, you need to clean house. You need to get rid of some stuff. There's some of you, you just need to create an atmosphere. Hey, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's some of you, you need to evict some unwanted gas today. You need to kick that jealousy, kick that fear, kick that pride, kick that lust out of your life. So as the worship team begins to lead us in just a moment, those of you who lifted your hand, you said, I need Jesus. I want you to get out of your seat without hesitation. It doesn't matter if anybody else moves. I want you to come right here to the front because some of our leaders are going to pray with you. If you need to evict some unwanted guests, if you need to clean house in your own life, Come on, you need, to, you need to create some atmosphere with him. I want you to just take a step towards him and come around this front just for the next few minutes. We've got about three or four minutes left in this service. I want you to come right now to the front. Come on, begin to move right now. Begin to move right now. I believe the Lord's going to honor that today. Just begin to move and say, God, I want to cultivate an atmosphere in my life. I need Jesus in my life. Come on, if that's you, you lifted your hand. Come on, if you know you need to clean up, you need to create some space, you need to kick some unwanted guests out. Come on, right now. Right now. Right now. Come on. Would you move? Come on, as we sing, if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, I want you to get out of your seat. Come right here to the front so somebody can agree with you. Somebody can pray with you today. The rest of you that are at your seats. Would you take these last couple of moments? Would you just lift your hands? Would you lift your voices? Come on, would you just declare the worthiness of God today as we sing? Worthy you are. Worthy you are. Worthy you are. Worthy you are. 